So the official uh, computational statistics time is right <laughs> here. Okay. Well, welcome back, everyone. I am so sorry that I had to cancel class uh, last time, especially to have to do it so uh, uh, just a little bit before our current our class that was supposed to meet. Uh, did anyone by chance show up in the classroom? Okay. I am sorry. Before I left, which was about 9:40. I talked to one of our secretaries in our office, Stacy. I said, could you please go down there at 11 a.m. Uh, just in case some of my students don't get the lister post? And she said, sure. Well, then when I got back here, uh, got back then later that afternoon, she says, Chris, I'm so sorry, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. It, it happens. I, I hope you weren't too, too lost about what was going on. Uh, but, uh, Hopefully, this won't happen again. See, usually, my wife and I, when, whenever we have a, one of our children sick, and unfortunately that does happen, uh, she knows that when I'm teaching, uh, she needs to take care of the kids. And when, I, when I'm not teaching, then I'm usually the, the first go-to person to take care of the kids when they are sick. Um, anyway, uh, in the end, you know, we, we lost one day of the semester. I'm not concer really concerned about it because if you know that Tuesday and Thursday classes during the spring meet one extra day than the Monday Wednesday classes because of Martin Luther King Day. So in the end, we're right the same as if we were in a Monday Wednesday class in terms of number of meetings. Um, so uh, I made some adjustments to our schedule uh, since we last met then. Uh, we will continue with Monte Carlo simulation today. We will talk about assignment number one today. Um, Assignment number one is tentative due date, depending upon, make sure that we do get through all the material on time, is February 4th now, that's uh, a week from tomorrow at noon. Um, let's see. My goal for the midterm is basically to get through Monte Carlo simulation and the bootstrap, uh, maybe a little bit of parallel processing, we'll see. I, I think of this as a tentative date as well, but it will be somewhere around this time period, no earlier than this date. If I page down, you can see some major changes that I made. Um, so, you know, going into this class, I had hoped that we would do some kind of presentation, because I think especially for a PhD level class, that can be very helpful, where uh, you get some freedom to decide on a particular topic, and then you can present it here. Um, and, you know, originally we had, I think, uh, at one point we might have had 12 students registered for this course and to do as long of presentations as they would like. I, I think of a minimum presentation should be half a class period. And to have 12 students to do that, that just would take too much time. Uh, so I always had kind of in my back of my mind that, you know, if we got down to eight for some reason, uh, that would be the most that we could handle. And we are in fact at eight right now. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what I anticipate doing in, in, towards the end of April is that we'll have half day presentations over particular topics um, uh, uh, during that time period. Um, and that will replace a final exam. So there will be one written exam in this class, the midterm. You know, I was kind of worried if I could actually write, actually have an in-class written exam for some of these other topics. Um, and so that's why I'm also very glad that I think we can do some presentations. Uh, I'll give you more details about the presentations later. I still haven't written it up yet. Uh, but they will be similar in format to what I've done in my Tools for Statisticians class, if you've talked to uh, students uh, in that class in the past. Basically, the presentation itself would not be like a, a research presentation. Rather, the, rather it would be more like a teaching presentation, where you, partic you, you uh, pick a particular topic, such as, um, <clears throat> well, let, we'll, see, we'll, we'll say Python. So the Python software package. And in a half a class period, you tell us as much about Python as possible so that we could also do a corresponding homework assignment that you give everyone. That way, to do, that way, doing a presentation in that format rather than, let's say, like what you would expect in a seminar, um, this means that not only do you learn about a particular topic by, by presenting it, 
everyone in the class will also learn, and they will learn a lot more than if they didn't have to do, let's say, like a, like a homework problem. So, you know, I, what I anticipate is that all of you will write a, like, a, like a 10 point homework problem where you can think of my points in terms of, you know, like this, this here is uh, worth 47 points, this particular assignment. So, you know, like one fourth, one fifth of one of these assignments, that's what you will be writing. So, obviously, you can't get into too much detail, but at least it makes a student uh, who's, who's painted, who's, who's uh, watching the presentation, it makes them take, let's say, extra notes about what was going on in the presentation because they are going to have to do some stuff uh, or implement some stuff that was basically talked about in the presentation. Okay. Um, that's a little bit more than what I wanted to say right now, but that's where I'm going with it. Um, uh, hopefully within a few weeks I'll have an opportunity to write up more details about it so that you can start preparing for it as well. Are there any questions though at, that, at this time about that presentation stuff that I just mentioned? So will you be giving us a list of topics? Okay? Yeah, so I'll be giving you a list of topics that you can choose from or you can pick your own subject to my, um, my approval, okay? So I guess, yeah, well, we'll just leave it at that. Any other questions though? Yes, let's say there's like a specific topic that goes along with, like say your research that you're gonna present in seminar. That, that possibly could be it. The key is it has to be a computational statistics yeah. topic, in case okay. I didn't say that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, like Python, uh, I've also thought, like Gibbs sampling, for example, if you've heard of that, you know, uh, you give an introduction to Gibbs sampling. Uh, you give, um, uh, so for example, I, in a blog that I read today, there was a nice introduction about how to use GPUs instead of CPUs, but the graphical processing unit, the GPU, uh, to do computations on. And those can be a lot faster because you can really take advantage of parallel processing capabilities. So what one could do is you know, teach oneself how to do it and then essentially teach us some simple stuff of how to do it. Okay? At least when I did this with my tools for statisticians classes uh, the last two springs, I, um, I found this to be very beneficial for the students and even for me because there will be topics that you'll be presenting that I don't know a whole lot about. And, you know, this is, after all, PhD level course. We're here to learn. And, well, I know a lot. I know, don't know everything. And I, 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 I learned a lot uh, when, uh, when I taught the tools uh, course previously. Uh, other questions? Okay, so uh, let's uh, continue with the uh, Monte Carlo simulation. Okay, so what we were going to do next was to evaluate the true confidence level, actually estimate the true confidence level for two particular confidence intervals for the old population variance, sigma squared. And we looked at previously uh, the normal base interval, which you know, starts in its deprivation, assuming that the y sub i's are distributed iid normal. And that's our interval that you can see right here. I read pin out right here. Uh, the T, if you remember, mm -hmm. that in that case, this is a lowercase T, that means it's the observed sample variance um, from a sample. And we also talked about the asymptotic version of a confidence interval for sigma squared itself. And this is what it looked like. Of course, it's the estimator plus or minus the value from the standard normal times the square root of the estimated variance of the estimator. That mu hat 4 is, the, um, is an estimate of the fourth central moment. Also do note that this estimated asymptotic variance can actually be negative. And so you got to be careful about that, especially when you're doing Monte Carlo simulation. Okay, so that's where we left off last time. Let's take, take, uh, uh, take a look at how we can um, get the, the estimate of the true confidence level. So I'm going to jump on over here to um, TIN uh, that has my program in it. I already have my data all simulated. If you remember, our data is in y.sim based upon our previous example. 
Uh, it is simulated from a normal distribution, so you might have some expectations about which of these intervals is going to work better. We're going to let alpha be 0 0.05, so we're going to do 95% intervals. Move some of this over a little bit here. And what I've done here is I've written a function called sim.func, for the lack of a better name, uh, that calculates our two intervals for us. And I'm going to pass in two bits of information. One data set at a time, that's going to be in the y argument, and if I wanted to, I could actually change alpha as well. So inside this function, I'm going to find my sample size, I'm going to find my sample variance. Then, I find my normal based interval, just simply programming in uh, the correct function uh, formula for that. And then I put my normal based interval into an object called normal.based. Um, note that, he is, although it's not in my notes, uh, when I was preparing for my lecture, I thought, you know, I could have actually done this in, all in one line. So instead of taking three lines to calculate the interval and put it into an object, I could have actually done it in one line here if I was more efficient. Uh, with respect to the asymptotic interval, I calculate my mu hat 4, and then in one line I do actually calculate my asymptotic interval by taking advantage of vectorized calculations in R. And then lastly, notice I pass back my upper and lower limits for both intervals. So, of course, before you actually do this in a Monte Carlo simulation, uh, you, know, you should try it for one data set just to make sure it works. So, sim.func, y equal, let's do row one of my y.sim, that's my first data set. Let's see what we get here. So, um, is that big enough in the back? Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So, my um, normal base interval is about 1.8 to 14.6. My asymptotic interval is 0.46 to 7.05, about. So you can see there are some large differences between these two intervals. Same data set though, but large differences. Okay, so that's on page 18. Are there any questions about that? Well, let's look at how now we can do these calculations then for all 500 simulated data sets that we have. So this y.sim has 500 rows to it. Remember the sample size is nine, so it has nine columns. So every row is a, a particular data set. And because the data is structured in this way, the easiest way to do this rather than a for loop is to use the apply function. We've seen the apply function before. So I'm going to apply the function that I just wrote called sim.func to every row, that's margin equal one, of my data that's in y.sim. So that when I do that, I'm just going to highlight the apply portion of my code and then I'm going to run it. This is what I get. You can see the calculations are quite quick. So I get four rows and 500 columns back. So each column represents the results from one simulated data set. So we can see for the 500th simulated data set here, Here's my um, normal base interval. Here's my asymptotic base interval. So the last two rows are the asymptotic. The first two rows are the normal base. Now, generally speaking, I think we, we, we more or less think, think of results from a simulation, uh, set of simulations in, in a different format, where maybe each row of a return <coughs> data set that you get is actually for a data um, each, uh, let me see. Receive that. Each row basically gives the results for, for one simulated data set. So at least that's my prefer, preferred format. So I use the transpo transpose function to transpose that matrix of results. And if I do, I put the results into save.int, and this is what we get. So for the 500th simulated data set, look at the 500th row. Okay. So I have all these. Um, confidence intervals. Now, I purposely have not checked yet, is my true value of sigma squared in the confidence intervals yet? I didn't do that in my sim.func because that would be inefficient. What I can do is take advantage of how 
vectorized calculations were actually done and do, do those checks really, really quick. So I've created a, a separate function called summarize where I'm going to summarize the estimated true confidence levels and also the corresponding estimated expected lengths. So in this function itself, I'm going to pass in all these 500 intervals that we have for, for both confidence intervals. And then I'm also going to pass in the true value of sigma squared, which it ends up being 4.82. So inside the function then, this is where I'm going to check. Is sigma squared within an in, in interval. And to do that, <clears throat> I'm going to use an if else function. So I can say if else tests is sigma squared greater than the lower bound from my normal base interval. Lower bound is normal, normal base intervals in that first column of my uh, what would be my, my result from my um, simulations. If it is, great. Now sigma squared could be in the interval. But let's check to make sure that it's less than the upper bound. So I do another if else. And I test, is sigma squared less than my upper bound for my normal base interval? If it is, then great. That means sigma squared is captured by the inner interval. So I'm going to assign a value of 1. If it's not, assign a value of 0. Also, if originally sigma squared was actually less than the lower bound, assign a value of zero. So, um, so what this is going to give me, the part that I have highlighted there, is a bunch of zeros and ones. Ones if sigma squared is in the interval, zero if it's not. Now what we want to do is summarize it. We want the proportion of times that sigma squared is in the interval. So what do we do? We simply take the mean of all the ones and zeros. Now, if you remember how I told you that we could have problems with calculating that variance for the asymptotic interval, where the variance could be negative, and when I take a square root of a negative number, you got problems. So because of that, in all my code here, I have a, I've used an additional argument, na.rm, which means if, if I can't calculate, if, if, inter, if, if this if else, um, here gives me a, um, an NA, meaning not, not available, cannot calculate it, which would have been the result for um, if I have a problem with calculating one of these intervals. If, 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 if I have an NA, then simply I want to remove that observation, or I should say observation, that results from that simulation uh, from, from this calculation so I can still calculate a mean. Now, with the normal base interval, this isn't going to happen. Uh, and perhaps I shouldn't even put the na.rm equal true there. It shouldn't happen. But I, I don't know. I guess I just did it for consistency's sake because you do need it for the asymptotic case. Any questions about that? Okay, so, so normal.base1 is going to be now the estimated true confidence level for the normal base interval. ASM1 is going to be the same for the asymptotic. To calculate then the expected length is actually ra rather easy. Just take the upper bound <coughs> minus all the lower bounds. Again, I'm using all these vectorized calculations so I can do it all at once. And then simply take the mean. Do that for both kinds of intervals. And then of course you need to know, well, how often did I have this problem with this estimated variance being negative so that I couldn't calculate the interval? You always need to report those kinds of things in any kind of paper where you're doing a Monte Carlo simulation study. So here's some code to figure out how often did this problem happen. So through testing out my program, again, I knew that if an interval limit could not be calculated because of this variance problem, I knew that I would get an NA back. Um, and so I check, is a particular value equal to NA? So I use the is.NA function. I do this for the lower bound. And I also do it for the upper bound as well. And then I combine them. Maybe I should have put a space there. That uh, vertical line there means or. 
So if at least one of those two things returns a true for a particular data set, I'm going to get a true back. So it's like an and or, maybe that might be a better way to say it, that vertical line there. And because R treats um, truths and falses as ones and zeros respectively whenever math is done, so when I sum all those trues and falses, I will get the number of data sets where I had a problem. And then lastly in this function, I just summarize, put everything in a nice little format so that I can return the results to me. So let's try this out, or let's actually do it. So I say summarize intervals equal where all my intervals are, save.int, and I also put in what my value of sigma squared is, and this is what I get. So first of all, notice that we didn't have any problems with the data sets, so that's good. So normal base, the uh, estimated true confidence level is about 96%. This is not uh, unexpected, or I should say, I should say it that way. This is expected because we are simulating our data under the same assumptions of that confidence interval. Take a look at the asymptotic interval. 0.712 is the estimated true confidence level. Why do you think that occurred? Why is it so far down? <laughs> it should be, you know, the stated level is 95%. Maybe, maybe the answer is too obvious and you don't want to speak up. Why do you think this happened? Or maybe I put the answer in my notes. Did I put the answer in my notes? I don't think I did. Why, why do you think this is happening? So, asymptotics. That's based upon what? N goes to infinity, yes. So as n goes to infinity, you know, essentially we have a statistic that has a particular normal distribution to it. Did I take a sample size of infinity? No, I was just a little bit short. <laughs> sample size of nine. Okay. Now, let's say, for example, you present this to your advisor, this result. The advisor says, wow, 71% only? Are you sure you did your programming right? What would you say? Yes, I did do my programming right. <laughs> well, what you would probably would want to say is, doctor such and such. Well, I can check over my work some more. And in fact, what I could do is increase the sample size. Because we know as n goes to infinity, this should end up working out in, in the end, right? So, you know, whenever you, you were left with a situation like this where you get something that's, you know, quite low there, but you know it should work out at some point, this is when, you know, you try some more simulations. Find the end where, indeed, you get, do get about 95%. And that way, if that happens, that's a great way to verify that, indeed, your programming is correct. Trust me, from experience, programming, you can have errors in your programming. Okay, so this is like almost a foolproof way, almost. Let's say 95% of the time. This will help catch errors. Let's take a look at the expected lengths. Estimated expected lengths, to be more precise. Normal base, 15.8. Uh, asymptotic, 5.79. So, you know, someone might be looking at, let's say a naive statistician might be looking at this and saying, oh, I'm going to use that asymptotic interval because I'm going to have a shorter interval on average. Should you use the asymptotic interval? No. Start with taking a look at the true confidence level. If you have an interval that has approximately the correct value in terms of the true, uh, the true confidence level, then look at the expected length. So I don't really care that the expected length here is much shorter for asymptotics. I know in terms of co the confidence level, it's doing really, really poor.
Are there any questions? Okay, so page 20. So just a really small change to the notes there in blue. Just to be more precise. So basically what we've done so far is talked about three different common uses of Monte Carlo simulation in a statistical research setting. You know, you're looking for the unbiasedness of an estimator, you're looking at um, true confidence level, you're looking at size and power. Here's the fourth one that, that you will often see in statistical research, and that is you want to know is your estimated standard deviation, or you could say your variance, um, you know, in terms of the square of the standard deviation, uh, of an estimator, is it really estimating the correct, is it really correct? And so that's what we want to do from Monte Carlo simulation is to make that judgment. Is our, you could also say your standard error, is it correct? Okay? And there's going to be some very similar things to what we did with the unbiasedness of a, um, of a statistic T, uh, but there's going to be one little twist to it. Okay, so, so why is this important? Well, you know, it just goes back to something like this. You know, suppose you're, you know, you're doing maximum likelihood estimation and you're interested in a particular hypothesis test for a parameter theta, and you use a simple walled test for that. Um, now, what we're interested in this little subsection is this guy right here. We want to know, am I, is this a good estimator or not? Well, what happens if this is too small? What's going to happen to your test statistic? In terms of absolute value, it's going to get high, higher than what it should. And then if you looked at, let's say, um, the size of this test, then what would you expect to have happen? Would it hold the correct size? Would it maintain the correct size of the test? No. Is it going to reject too often or not enough? It's going to reject too often, exactly. Uh, so that's why this is very important. Also, again, a naive statistician might uh, look at the power. Do you think the power, if, if this estimated variance was too small, do you think that power might be higher than maybe other statistical procedures that hold the correct size? Yes. Because you're already, you cannot maintain the correct size. You're already rejecting too much when the null hypothesis is true. That's just going to con continue to carry forward when you look at power. And so a naive statistician will see that and say, yeah, I want to use this because I have high power. No, 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 no. You can't maintain the correct size. You should not use it. Just a little question here, just to make sure you're getting what you should out of other classes. Suppose t is a maximum likelihood estimator of theta. What would you use for the estimated variance of t? I'm pretty sure you talked about this in set 971. You should have first seen it in set 883. What would you use for this estimated variance if you are working with a max likelihood -like estimator? What would be the easiest thing to use, maybe? Maybe that might be a better way, way to put it. It's named after one of the most famous statisticians ever. He was from the UK. He liked to take. He liked to have ladies taste tea. <laughs> Fisher. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the Fisher information matrix. Okay. Obviously, oh, well, although they didn't necessarily state this here, but you can probably tell from the way I wrote it. You know, we have a, uh, you know, a scalar value here, so, you know, matrix would be a one by one, but you would use the, not just the Fisher information matrix. What 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 else? The inverse of the Fisher information matrix. And in fact, you would use the inverse of the observed Fisher information matrix. Okay? Remember talking about that in 971? 
Hopefully, mm -hmm. maybe. Some people, a few people are shaking their heads. Others are just looking down. <laughs> um, well, this next part here might, might be um, more difficult than uh, given my, my last uh, set of responses. What are some common qualities of this estimator? Is this a good estimator? It's easy to use, right? You know, you just uh, work with some second derivatives of a log likelihood function, right? Mm -hmm. But what are some qualities of this estimator? Is it good? Is it bad? Are there any problems ever using it? You ever talked about that in another class? Mm -hmm. What? No real problem. Well, now you're getting at something. Yeah, you remember the kramer rao lower bound mm -hmm. in 883? Mm -hmm. Okay. You know the relationship then with the Fisher information. Now, a key part of that CRLB, kramer rao lower bound, is the word lower. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, do you think that this estimator is going to be over uh, too high or too low often? going to be too low. What happens then when you have an estimator that is too low for that Z statistic there? What did we just talk about? Yeah, you're going to have problems with size issues. Okay. Now, you know, you, you, I, this, is, this, is, this is an important point, especially for PhD students, it's a very important point to understand is that, you know, basically when we, when we use them, the inverse of the observed Fisher information matrix. That is a covariance matrix that you can use with a maximum likelihood estimator. But the, you have to realize, though, that this is the asymptotic variance. So as n goes to infinity, you know, this is going to be a good estimate. What happens if you have n equal 9? I don't know. That's where Monte Carlo simulation comes in to evaluate how good that estimator is for a fixed sample size. It's not, because uh, again, the one sample size you can never have is infinity. Although my, my five-year-old son, he has told me that he has, in, he has counted to infinity three times. <laughs> and I, I tried to tell him, no, you know, explain it to him. He said, no, daddy, I have counted to infinity three times. <laughs> Anyway, so I want to know then for a fixed sample size, how good is the estimated variance of t in estimating, let's say, the true variance of t? That's what I want to know. And well, what do we do? Well, what we could do, make sure you get this right here. We could look at, let's say, the expected value of the estimated variance of t. The problem is you, you're, you're not going to be able to calculate that this most of the time, you know, through simple pencil and paper. But if we could somehow get it, maybe estimate then this expected value, we can compare it to what the true value of variance of t is. And if the two are close, well great, you got a good estimator. If they're not, then you should start worrying. Also another problem then with this kind of evaluation is, well what exactly is the variance of t? You know, like in, in step 971, did you ever see what the true variance of a maximum likelihood estimator that you were calculating all the time was? No. There are some special cases where you can calculate what that true variance is, such as, let's say, if you have a sample mean. You know, all of you have done that proof before. Sigma squared divided by n. That's the true variance. That's it. But, you know, let's say... Uh, do you know what the true variance is of beta hat for, let's say, a logistic regression model? No. Okay. So, how can I check then if the variance, the estimated variance of t, is a good estimate of the true variance of t when I don't even can calculate the variance of t exactly? This is how you can use Monte Carlo simulation to, to, to deal with this. The first three parts here should look familiar because it basically comes from the unbiasedness of an estimator t part on my notes. Okay, 
So let's simulate our data sets under the same conditions where the parameter of interest is known. So maybe I'm going to simulate data from a normal mu equal 1, sigma squared equal 5. I'm going to calculate my estimated variance for my statistic for every single data set. And then I'm going to average these estimated variances across all simulations. So what is this quantity estimating? What is this estimating? <coughs> the answer is on this screen. I hear, I hear some, some voices, but I cannot hear exactly what's being said. The model team. Excuse me? Model team. The, no. No. The estimated predicted value of the estimated Yeah, variance. this right here. That's what that's estimating. You know, remember, we're, we're, we're just like with this unbiased section that we, we, we looked at at the beginning of this set of notes, you know, how do we estimate an expected value? Well, you simulate a bunch of data sets, and you take the average of this value that you're calculating for every data set. That makes sense. Expected value. It's, you know, it's an average, essentially. Okay. Now, here comes the, the, the new part. Again, I'm not going to know what this guy is, but maybe I could come up with a very good estimate of what variance of t, the true variance of t should be. So, all I need to do is take the sample variance of all my t's that I'm calculating for every single uh, simulated data set. That's it. Well, why, why do you think that this would be a, a, a good thing to do for, for this part right here? Why do you think it would be good to do? What did you learn in, uh, probably towards the beginning of stat 83, maybe the end of stat 882? If I have a... I'm biased. I'm biased, yeah. So let's say if I just have a, and let's just take it out of the context of, our, of my notes. You know, if I have a sample variance, S squared, you know, you learned this. Okay? That's why we're that's why we're doing this. Now, obviously, you know, every S squared is not going to be equal to sigma squared. But you know, if you have a large sample that you're working with, the larger your sample is, the closer you would expect then this estimate to get to the true value. And we control R here, remember that? We control R. So as long as I take a large R, hey, this is, this, this is reasonable to do. So then what we do in order then to make a judgment of is my estimated variance of T, is that a good estimator or not? Well, you could simply compare these two big quantities that we're calculating, you know, just look at them visually. Or what's more often done is you look at um, the ratio. If you've heard of relative efficiency before, maybe in another class, where you take the ratio of two variances, this is essentially what we're doing here. So my quantity W then is my average of all my estimated variances divided by what's approximately the variance of T. If this W is close to one, that says great. My estimated variance of my statistic that I'm proposing is a good estimate. If it's less than one, that says, uh-oh, I'm underestimating. Again, think of the consequences of doing that relative to what we did, uh, what we talked about a few minutes ago. If the W is greater than one, that says, oh, my estimate of my variance is actually overestimating, which still you don't want to have happen. You should think of it in terms of a hypothesis test about why you wouldn't want that to happen. You know, your power is probably going to be too high or too low? Lower than what you would expect. Uh, but still, I would prefer to have an est um, I would prefer to have a, uh, estimated variance that's too high than I would for too low. Again, it just comes back to the conservativeness of what we do in, in, in science. Okay. 
Now, that W measure there, you could also use standard deviations instead. So if I wanted to, I could have done the average of my standard deviations. I could have done that. Um, and then also put a one half there. I could have done that. And sometimes it's, it's, uh, it can be a preferred thing to do to compare standard deviations like this rather than variances. Because variances, remember, are on a squared scale, square unit scale. So often differences are magnified by working with variances than the standard deviations. And also, you know, what are we using actually in the end? Well, you know, if we go back to this statistic here that we saw, well, look what I'm using here. I'm actually using the square root of the estimated variance anyway. So it makes sense to compare standard deviations rather than variances. Okay, so let's actually uh, take a look at an example of where I put into practice um, uh, three of the four uh, things that we've been talking about for in, um, uh, in terms of how Monte Carlo simulations are used in statistical research. So this is a paper of mine uh, and uh, uh, the first author there is Bowen Jong. He was a PhD student of mine, actually my very first PhD student. Um, he graduated in, 2000, in 2012. Um, he is working at, I think, it's a pharmaceutical company in Philadelphia, I think it's Merck. Uh, after he told me that he, he got the job, I said, so, well, how much are they, are, they made, are they giving you for salary? And he told me, I said to him, you know, that's higher than my salary. <laughs> so I tell you that, and I'm very happy for him. But I tell you that because some of you might want to go into academics and, you know, uh, beware when you go into academics, you do make a sacrifice. <laughs> uh, anyway, there's a lot of good benefits of being in academics too. Uh, so, so this is uh, uh, then the, um, the abstract from the paper. I just put it there in case you wanted to see it. Uh, the main thing that you need to understand from this paper in order for you to understand the simulations that we're going to look at is as follows. What we did was we proposed a, a way to estimate uh, essentially a regression model. Uh, not just your normal everyday regression model though. Basically what we had was correlated binary data as our responses. You probably talked about correlated binary data in your STAT 971 class. Um, but also what made this unique was our responses were not observable. So we had unobservable, correlated, binary responses. So your Ys that you typically observe, they were binary, we knew that. But I couldn't actually observe them. Instead, I, I could observe some other information. And I wanted to use this other information to help me estimate my model. Um, we use a procedure called the Expectation Solutions Algorithm, or ES Algorithm for short. Um, again, it's not important for you to know that, uh, but basically, uh, without getting all the details, uh, generalized estimating equations, which you would have talked about in 971, is a special case of uh, basically using the ES algorithm. So you can think of like a GE case with correlated binary data, but you don't know the Ys, and, and simply what you have to do is, uh, to some respect, simply replace the Ys with their expected values, given the information you do observe. Okay, enough about that. So I want to evaluate how good is this model estimating procedure that I'm using, uh, how good is it? Um, and so there's going to be a parameter alpha that I want to estimate. It basically represents the correlation between my binary random variables. Also, I want to estimate my betas. And just like often you see in, in many other settings, my betas are my regression parameters. So like, you know, beta zero would be like my intercept. Beta one would be like my slope. I want to estimate betas. My overall sample size is a component of two, two parts, uh, something called K and something called I. Um, it's not really important that you know what those two parts are. Just realize that if I take something, if I take a K times an I, I get my overall sample size. Uh, this paper was in uh, Statistics in Medicine. Uh, which is, um, uh, I would say, a high second tier journal for statisticians. Uh, if you're not familiar with this concept, um, 
which I wouldn't be surprised if some of you are not. Uh, statisticians typically uh, 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 kind of group journals, stat journals, into two tiers. A first tier journal, a second tier journal. You want to publish in first tier journals. Uh, all statisticians will largely agree on five first tier journals. Uh, journal of the American Statistical Association, Journal of the Royal Statistical, Soci Royal Statistical Society, Series B, um, Annals of Statistics, um, uh, Biometrics, and Biometrica. Those five. Those are the big five. If you give publication to one of those five, you are quite happy. Okay. Some people might put some other journals in there, one or two other journals, but typically everyone agrees on those five. Then all the other journals are second tier journals. And they're, they, they, are, they are good, uh, but you know, often the way that I approach um, research is that I want to publish something in a first tier journal. And so I'm going to maybe submit there first. And if it doesn't work out, then I'll go to a second tier journal. So for example, with this paper, we submitted it to Biometrics. They encourage a revision, they revise it, and then they reject it. It's quite disappointing. And then we submitted to uh, some statistics and medicine, uh, which is often a, a good, a, a good alternative, um, high second tier journal. And fortunately, we got accepted after a few rounds of revisions. Um, anyway, so so let's take a look at. Then this is um, actually comes from the paper itself. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so that we can see it better. This comes from the paper, um, and. You know, unfortunately, journals are known for uh, screwing up uh, the display of tables. And they didn't really display my stuff as well as I had in my paper that I had submitted. Uh, so that's why you see these lines drawn in there. Those are my lines, not from the journal itself. Let's take a look at now the first case here. OK, so I simulated some data. Or I should say Bowen simulated some data with a correlation of 0.6 between two, random two binary random variables. My overall sample size was 2,500. If we look at the beta hat 01 comp, so this is an estimated regression parameter, on average for 1,000 simulated data sets, on average we got negative 5.87, where the true value was negative 0.6. So we're fairly close, fairly close. Then for another regression parameter, negative 6.95, true value negative 7. Again, kind of close. You can keep on looking at these other ones, and you can, again, keep on saying, yeah, we're kind of getting close. So that's good. I, I'm, not, I'm not dissatisfied with this. Or I should say, I am satisfied. That's, that's a better way to put it. For my correlation parameter, 0.61. Uh, I guess just to make sure, like in a GE context, you know, you have these nuisance correlations that you have to estimate. This is essentially that. True value is 0.6. Hey, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy with that. Let's go down to the next row here. SE divided by SD. This is like my W in terms of standard deviations. Okay? So remember, after we got done with um, me introducing W, I said, well, you know, you can put a square root on these, on that numerator and that denominator. That's what this was, essentially. And so the goal is for W to be what? One. So what do you think? What's happening? What's happening with my, along with this estimator that I'm proposing, these beta hats, I'm also proposing a set of, of uh, variances as well. What do you think is happening? Or, or, or what do you think? It's underestimating. A little bit. Not too, too bad. But it's underestimating. Then I have a row called coverage. This is my true confidence level. Estimated true confidence level. My goal here is I have 95% walled intervals. So my goal is 95%. What do you think? Are you okay with it, or it's fairly close, fairly close. I'm generally speaking okay with it. We'll look at a better way to more precisely make that judgment um, shortly. 
So now let's take a look at an, another case here. Now case 250 and I is 10. Now without getting into all the details here, um, in this case I will actually, I'm, I'm actually will be observing less information. I don't want to get into all the details, but you can think of this, I'm actually observing less information here. Even though I have the same overall sample size, I'm observing less information. For those of you who know anything about group testing, I is my group size. Um, so let's take a look here. What do you think of my beta hex? Kind of similar to what we had before. You know, not too bad. How about the SE divided by SD? Now it's getting lower, right? Okay. And that kind of makes sense based on the little bit that I told you, that we have less information. So you might think that my estimation that I'm going to do is not going to be as good. It's reflected in my simulation results. Look at my coverages. They're also get a little bit lower. Okay, so you know, when I'm doing a Monte Carlo simulation, uh, set of Monte Carlo simulations, I might see something like this first. Maybe I do these simulations first. Well, then what I would be interested in doing is determining, well, how can I get these values better? What sample size is it going to take me take to get these values better? Um, so, so, we can come down here. So now I have a sample size of 5,000. And you can take a look at my, essentially my W's. You can see that they're getting better. And suppose I do sample size of 10,000. And you can see how those W's are going to what? One. Okay. So what Bowen did in his dissertation, um, in this corresponding paper, he did some really cool proofs, mathematical proofs, uh, that showed as n goes to infinity, you should get a particular um, uh, estimated variance. Okay? And we knew that as n goes to infinity. What this set of simulations then tells us for this particular case, well, how large does n have to be before then that corresponding estimator that you, dri you derive for n goes to infinity before it actually you know, works fairly well. And we can see when that happens. Are there any questions? <clears throat> so another thing that you would do in one of these settings, notice also I use an alpha equal 0.2. So I want to look at, well, what happens if I have uh, a lower correlation? And, and, and what you can do is then, let's say, compare the correlation of 0.6 to the correlation of 0.2 to see if there are any trends. So you look for trends in terms of your sample sizes. You look for trends in terms of, let's say, your settings for your simulated data, such as my alpha here. That's how you can come up with an overall judgment of, well, how good is your statistical procedure? Are there any questions? Okay, so let's uh, take a look at then back at this estimating um, a population variance problem. Okay, so the question then is, well, what should you use for the estimated variance of t? Now remember, t is a sample variance. Well, what's the variance of a variance essentially? Well, remember when I you know, introduced you to the asymptotic interval, I said that one could derive an, S, an, an, an estimated asymptotic variance of t to be that expression. So what one could do is maybe use this for my estimated variance. Essentially, when you are working with generalized linear models, when you're working with generalized linear mixed models, again, you're using that inverse of the observed Fisher information matrix to do all your variances. What you're calculating is essentially this. And you are using it for the var part there. Okay. 
Okay. Now there's another estimator of the variance that one could use. And that's because we have this very simplistic setting here uh, where we know that the y's have a normal distribution. We also know that t has a gamma distribution to it. So in fact, we know what the variance of t actually is when y has a normal distribution. Well, you know, it just goes back to Kesselenberger, set 882. It would be 2 sigma to the fourth divided by n minus 1. So it just so happens for this problem, and that's why I pick it, we know what the actual result should be. It's doing stuff like this in teaching is often a very nice thing to do, because you know what the right answer should be. But also what this does, it allows us to think about, well, how else could I estimate this variance? Well, how about we just simply, where you see that parameter sigma, suppose we just stick in its corresponding estimator. So what we could also use for the vari estimated variance of t is 2 times t squared divided by n minus 1. We could use that. So let's see which estimate or I should say, let, let's see which estimator is better. Now ideally, what I would have done in my original sim.func function that we saw earlier, I would have put in this additional information about estimating the variances and saved those results back to me so that I could immediately check this. I didn't do this because, again, I'm introducing it more in a, in a teaching context, but if I was doing it for real for an actual paper, I would have got everything done at once rather than running separate simulations for this case, separate from the previous cases that we've seen. Okay, so let's take a look at my code here. So I write a function called var.examine, for the lack of a better name. I'm going to pass in one data set at a time. Inside the function, I'm going to calculate my sample size, calculate my sample, um, uh, sample variance, and then I'm going to calculate my two estimates of the variance of t. And then I return, in the end, t, the estimated var variance using the asymptotic approximation, and then also uh, the estimated variance using my normal distribution. So of course, again, I want to try this out in one data set to make sure it works. So I say var.examine y equal my first data set, and this is what I get. So my sample variance for my first data set is 3.97. The estimated variance of t for using the, um, the asymptotic approximation is 3.2, and then using the normal distribution approximation is 3.9. So they're not too, too far off. Now I like to repeat this for every single simulated data set that I got. So that's where the apply function comes in. It's the same concepts as we saw before. So I'm going to just run that code. I'm going to put the results into save.var. So for example, make sure you're seeing this. My last simulated data set, t was 5.33. The estimated asymptotic variance was 4.46. And then um, the estimated variance using that normal approximation was 7.1. So what do you think, just from looking at those numbers, the last two columns, what do you think is going to happen? Do you see any trends? The last two columns. Or are you just kind of tired? You just want to leave? The normal one's always kind of larger. Yeah, the normal one's always kind of larger. Without even looking at my notes any further, which one do you think will end up being better? The normal one or the asymptotic one? Okay, the answer is too obvious. The normal one, because we're, that's how we're simulating our data. And we know the problems that we saw with the asymptotic one, with the confidence interval. No, let's see if that happens. So, remember, one of the things that we have to do is we have to take the mean of all those estimated variances. A quick way to do that is to use the col means function for column means. So I'm going to do that for the second and third column of my saved result. So if you just take a look at those estimate those means 
Take a look at that. Look at how big the difference they are. For the asymptotic method, on average, 3.13. Normal, 7.6. Wow. Now also, so that I can have a good idea of what that true variance of t is, I can then simply find the variance of all my t's. I have 500, essentially a sample size of 500, so I would expect that to be pretty good. We'll put that in a sample, or sample.var. And this is what I get, 6.46. Then, let's take the ratio. So, is my asymptotic variance, is it over or, or underestimating? It's underestimating by a lot, about 50%. My variance based upon my normal distribution is a little overestimating some. We can also compare this to the true variance, because again, remember, we know what the true variance is. 2 sigma squared squared, I guess sigma to the fourth, <laughs> divided by n minus 1. So we can instead, in the denominator, put that true variance in this, this W ratio. And again, we see similar results. Uh, let me go on over here to my notes. We can also work with the standard deviations as well. And this is what we get. In particular, take a look at the second one here. So this is using the normal distribution, 0.97. So it's doing a good job. My one based upon the asymptotics is not. Okay, any questions? So, you know, I encourage you, this is a PhD course, you know, you know just uh, take, take a look at a journal, take a look at jazz, take a look at biometrics. Usually it's the second to last section of a paper will be a Monte Carlo simulation study. You're going to probably find one of these, just like what we did, or you're going to find many of these, just like what we did in, in, in a particular issue of a journal. Let's uh, talk about the assignment. Okay. So due February 4th at noon, at least that's tentatively, you may work in pairs. I encourage you to work in pairs. Um, and I think a lot can be gained from working in a group rather than individually. Uh, because questions that you may have can be answered by your group member and vice versa. Um, I'm a big proponent of group work and I strongly encourage you to do that. Um, you know, if you don't know who you want to work with, of course, you, know, you can always post a message to the listener saying, hey, does anyone uh, want to work together? If you work in a, in, if you work in a group, a uh, group of two, you only need to hand in one thing, one completed project, or one completed assignment. Okay, not, not two. Um, so, let's take a look at this. So, uh, complete the following problems below. Within each part, include your R program output with code inside of it and any additional information to explain your answer. All R code that you need to solve a, for a particular problem needs to be in there. Because well, often what I will do is I will copy and paste your R code that you put in your document I will copy and paste that into my program editor and then run it. If it doesn't run, well, then I know there's a problem with your code and you might miss points. So it's essential that you include everything. Even, uh, although I guess you're not doing it here, if you had to, let's say, read in a data set, I want to see the code. And the code and output should be presented in a way just like in my lecture notes. <coughs> So notice here, I have a line of code that I run from the R console, essentially. So you see the actual prompt there. You see another line, you see another line, and then you have the output right with it. I don't want to see the code in one place and then the output in another place. I want to see it as you would see it in, essentially, your R console window. 
Uh, the code should be formatted, like you see in my notes. Uh, a courier font, to make sure everything lines up rather nicely, since courier letters have exactly the same width. Um, also, if, let's say, some code extends over to another line, please make sure you format it nicely. There are some examples in my notes someplace, like, for example, here. Notice how I indented that code that went to the next line. You know, present your code in a professional manner. You know, let's say if you had some code in your dissertation, you would not want that to be messy. You would not give messy code and output to your advisor. You would not give messy code and output to, let's say, a supervisor at your eventual job where you make more money than me. So please uh, format everything nicely. Okay, so the purpose of this problem then is for you to obtain simply some experience with Monte Carlo simulation in the context of simple linear regression models. I want to make sure I use a topic that obviously all of you should have some experience with. Um, so this is my model. So this is my true model. You know, simple linear regression means you have one explanatory variable. Of course, with a simple linear regression model, you make the assumption that the error terms are independent, normal zero sigma squared. For this problem, I want you to make the assumption that beta zero is equal to one, beta one is equal to two, your variance is one. And I want you to simulate a sample, one sample for part A, a size 20. Well, what are the x's? Well, this is often a problem anytime you have a regression model you're using for Monte Carlo simulation. What do you use for the x's? What often is done is some people uh, just simply uh, simulate some data from a uh, uniform. And that's what I'm asking you to do here. Okay? Now, I want to make sure that, yes? If you have two x's, that's the same uniform? Excuse me? If you have two x's, that's, that's the x1, x1. Are you saying that if I had a model that looked like this, beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2? Yes. Well, obviously I don't in this particular case, <laughs> but if you did, you know, you might, uh, you know, again, say both x's are from uniforms, maybe different uniforms, maybe you could, depending on what you want to do, maybe you could use a multivariate normal for the x's. Okay? Maybe you might want to let an x be binary in an actual application. Here, I just want one x, and it's for coming from a uniform. So, I want to make sure that everyone simulates exactly the same data, because that will make it much, much easier for me to grade. So, set a seed of 9110 before you simulate anything, and then simulate your epsilons from an R norm function, and simulate your x's from r unif. Do the r norm first, do the r unif second. Then you can put obviously your x's in your model with your betas. You get out your y. If you did everything right, your first observation should be as what's shown here. If you don't get that, and you've tried and tried and tried and you still can't get it, let me know. Okay, I will help you. Part B, simply estimate the model. Tell me what the, all these statistics are for the, for the corresponding parameters. What would be a function of R that you could use to estimate the model? LM. LM, yeah. That's probably the simplest. Next, simulate 10,000 different data sets using the same process. Um, now, I purposely use such a large number there because some stuff later in, the, in this assignment, I want to make sure it takes at least a minute or two uh, rather than it immediately coming back to you instantaneously. So that's why I chose such a large R. In actual practice for Monte Carlo simulation, rarely would I ever use such a large R. Um, so use the same initial seed as in part A. And then to, and to make sure that you did everything correctly, the second simulated data set, the first observation should be that. So simulate all your epsilons first. So 10,000 times 20. Simulate all your x's 
next, 10,000 times 20. Find the y's and look for the second data set, what x and y should be. Make sure you get that. Part D, <clears throat> basically what I want you to do is tell me, how long would you expect the simulation, the, um, the, your, the simulations in terms of um, uh, calculating all the beta hats, the variances, uh, the sigma hat squares, how long is that going to take? I want you to estimate it based upon 100 simulated data sets. This will be discussed how to do this later in my notes. But let's say that you have already simulated your data, you've gotten your 10,000 beta hat zeros, your 10,000 beta hat ones, and so on. In part E, I'm um, sorry. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Okay, I guess part E is where you actually do it for all 10,000, excuse me. Um, I don't want to see all 10,000, so don't print off 10,000. I just want to see the first six. And basically, if you did everything right, your first six should match my first six. In terms of the beta hats, the estimated variances of the beta hat, one and sigma hat squared. Part F, evaluate the approximate unbiasedness of beta hat zero one, I'm sorry, beta hat zero, beta hat one, and sigma hat squared. That's using information that we talked about, not in this class, but I think it was the previous class. So the first use of Monte Carlo simulation we talked about. And then what we just got done talking about, that's what you're going to use with that estimated variance to evaluate, is it approximately unbiased? Yes? So do you want the output to be like in a data frame and head the six of like use the head frame? I, that would be one way to do it. Uh, part G, here's the standard expression that you've all used before for a confidence interval for beta 1 from a regression model. I want you now to find what the estimated true confidence level is. Uh, if you're doing 95% intervals. Tell me if it's conservative, liberal, or neither. Then part H, now you're going to be looking at the size of a test. Here's the test statistic that you've essentially all used before for a hypothesis test involving a beta with in, in simple linear regression. Since beta 1 is truly 2, that's why I want you to test it versus 2. Because the null hypothesis is, of course, true. Um, so that's the, you're looking at the estimated size. Part I here, I'm, gonna, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to go over too detailed. Basically, what, what I want you to do now is examine the sampling distribution of beta hat 1. You have 10,000 beta hat 1s. We also know what that sampling distribution should be. Um, you know, again, I would assume in stat 970 you learned it. If you, did it. if you took stat 870, you definitely would have learned it. I want you to do some, like an EDF plot, a histogram that compares the, your s stuff that you get from your simulations to um, what we know should happen. And then lastly, part 10 here, or, or, or question, uh, or number two, especially since this is a PhD level course, I want to give you some freedom to do some stuff that might interest you, other than I'm sure my number one was interesting, but uh, this might be more interesting to you. For a statistical problem of your own choosing, perform one set of Monte Carlo simulations. So for example, R equal 1,000. To evaluate the unbiasedness of an estimator, the true confidence level of confidence interval, or, notice I'm not saying and there, or the size of a hypothesis test. Describe the statistical problem so a student who has completed the first year of our MS program would understand it. So look back to what, see what first year grad students take. So for example, if you're doing some genetics problem, do you think that they're going to understand all the genetics <coughs> aspects of what you're talking about? Well, they might not unless you describe everything so that a first year grad student would understand it. Okay? So what could you do? Well, if you teach, let's say, set 218, well, maybe do a simple problem set 218 that you teach your students. You know, like a confidence interval for me. It's kind of boring, but you could do that. 
evaluate maybe the old t distribution uh, confidence interval. It's it's uh, true confidence interval. Or maybe something that you've learned about in uh, you know uh, one of your classes, maybe a step 971. You know, maybe you want to estimate a variance component. Um, just be careful, of course. Students, first year students, have not had step 971 yet, so you're going to have to explain some stuff in the context of, of first year math stat, probably, so that students would understand what you're doing in a step 971 setting. Okay, so you got some freedom there. If you, if any of you want to talk to me about ideas of what you want to pursue, just let me know. We can discuss it. Okay, we are out of time. Are there any questions? Okay, that's it for today.